Hello everyone, we're back again with another critique video. Today on the channel we have Dr. Allo. I have had a comment actually particularly related to Dr. Allo, which, you know, rekindled his name in my head, and I thought, wow, I haven't touched on him, and yeah, he does exist actually, and he says a lot of things about a lot of things, and a lot of stuff, and it needs corrected, necessarily, and quickly, and I will happily be the one to do it. This video is entitled, Cardiologist Shocked by Steak and Butter Gal's Cholesterol Results. Anyone that is watching my video and is present within the carnivorous space, or at least the low-carb ketogenic space, is probably familiar with Bella from Steak and Butter Gal, an influencer who really is very minimally offensive. She interviews who are colloquially deemed carnivore experts in the field, gets their opinion, is very open-minded when it comes to their opinion, and she just reports her experiences on carnivore and gives her opinions as to what other people should do and what behaviors they should employ if they're experiencing problems. She has every right to do that, and I think that she's helping a lot of people. And she's definitely helping get the message out there when it comes to carnivore and the entire space. Anyway, we're going to react to Dr. Allo here in this video, of course. And from everything that I've seen about Dr. Allo, he seems to be someone that is extremely offensive, insulting, arrogant, haughty, and, well, just overall a problem. Just a little side note, I was just reacting to this video for a while, and I got two and a half minutes into it, and I realized that my screen recording was not on, which means that, well, I have to restart this. So, yes, I've seen the first two and a half minutes of this, but this video is 16 minutes and 50 seconds, and the first two and a half minutes really have no substance to them in terms of what he says. So, anyway, with that being said, let's just jump directly into this and see what he has to say, and I suspect that it's going to be completely nonsensical as someone that doesn't know anything about cholesterol as much as he pretends to. Of course, before we get started, please subscribe to the Patreon if you haven't already to gain access to one week early uploads, ad-free content, uncensored content, and one extra video per week. And also, if you have not bought my book, Contraindicated, already, I would recommend doing that. It is the first edition. I am working on the second edition as we speak. And this second edition, honestly, is going to be a thousand times better than the first one in terms of its formatting and in terms of the information, the additional information that I have now administered into it and introduced into it. And just one more note, yes, the ebook is unavailable on Amazon. Amazon. At the moment, I am aware of this, and I am desperately trying to work with Amazon to return the presence of the ebook for availability, for purchase. We are having problems with the formatting, and that is a direct result of the scam artists, really, that we worked with, that we basically worked with for much too long before we came to our senses that they need to be pulled away from. We were exploited, we were tricked, whatever, but now it is in my hands, it is in my control, and I will ensure that it is of the utmost veracity, and it is of the utmost quality when it comes to the formatting especially for the ebook and the hardcover and the paperback. So with that being said, sorry for the speech there, but we are now going to jump directly into this and my screen recording is on and also my microphone is also on. So with that being said, let's rewatch the first two and a half minutes of this and hopefully we can fly through this faster than I was before. All right, today we are going to be going over steak and butter gals cholesterol levels. Now, why? Why are we doing that? Well, see, I asked that question, but really it's a rhetorical question, because we know why you're doing it. It is because you believe that cholesterol and any of the lipid proteins actually have any significance and are actually causal, actually, in the development of atherosclerosis heart disease or any manifestation of cardiovascular disease, including strokes, when it doesn't. And if you are new to the channel or if you're just curious to relearn some things, buy the second edition of my book when it's out. But for right now, I would refer to my channel page, click on the playlists tab and locate the cholesterol, saturated fat, and heart disease playlist. And I would specifically actually refer to Dr. Sunil Rao, the reaction I did on him. I cover that in pretty extensive detail. I'm going to explain it as well in this video, though, so you can also just sit tight because, boy, this will be a ride, I suspect. Some of these numbers are very, very scary. Well, that's your opinion, and it's based on erroneous foundation, ideological foundation, theological, actually, because you base your opinions on inferential statistics, standard inferential statistics that is a science that makes no claims about causality. Without additional machinery, i.e. causal inference, you cannot actually establish causal relationships in the area of inferential statistics, and it's very difficult to do that and very sophisticated anyway, and it's never done. And even then, actually, it, it's difficult to even establish causality there, but you can make extremely, extremely good inferences from it. Anyway, what were you saying, Alo? Of these numbers. Scary, scary, yeah, yeah, scary stuff. So that's your opinion. And if you knew anything about cardiology and lipidology, yeah, yeah, you're a cardiologist and you know, you have five years experience on me, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just a little kid and you know, I'm just, I'm just uh, an author of a book and I have no credentials. Yeah, I, I can already hear the arguments being espoused from you after you hear me say this because I will be tagging you in this video title. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter. You actually don't know what you're talking about. You're a cardiologist and you call yourself a lipidologist. And I'm here to tell you that even if you did have experience and you were 
disciplined and very voracious in this field of cardiology and lipidology that you still were not trained and clearly have not done any sufficient private training and responsible private training in the area of scientific interpretation. So to make causal claims and refer to studies that you have no idea how to interpret is irresponsible still. But anyway. Some of these numbers improved significantly, and we'll go over why. Well, again, with the word improved, given your stance on lipids and, you know, LDL levels and all that, what we can say is that an improvement in your eyes means a lowering. And if anything, if anything, that's actually contraindicated. But actually, the responsible thing to say here without any context is that cholesterol levels and LDL levels are determined by your genes and nothing else. They're actually dictated by your genes and nothing else. That's a proper use of the word dictated. Contra to what Ben Bickman was saying in his Randall Cycle video. And yes, I'm being callous in this video right now, but to put aside the sort of act, I don't mean any ill towards Ben Bickman. However, I am not personally a fan of the evasion of the invocations of his name on my video and Bart's video especially, because Bart actually has credentials to his name. So even if Ben didn't want to come on my channel because he thought it just wasn't appropriate since I'm just an author, I mean, I would disagree, but okay, fine. He still not only evaded Bart's invitation, but he actually went on Ken Berry's podcast or live stream, it's not really a podcast, and talked about the Randall cycle in further detail, despite the obvious case that we had things to say about his interpretations. Anyway, yes, genes are the dictators of cholesterol and LDL levels in the blood and in the body, systemically. Okay, so you shouldn't be interfering with your genetic programming. Those genes having evolved for billions of years, so I believe that they know what they're doing. They've had experience in this world. So go over why some of them are very, very scary. No, why you think they're scary, why you think they're scary, Alo, and I would guarantee that they're not. In fact, I've already seen them <laughs> because in the first two and a half minutes of the video, he already covered it, but we'll cover it again. We'll, di we'll dive really, really deep because this is something that I think a lot of people need to understand. Um, so that we know how to analyze cholesterol, why it may have... Yeah, we, we do need to understand it, and it's important that people know how to analyze cholesterol, or really, is it, actually? Because once you learn the details, you'll understand that you don't need to analyze cholesterol, okay? You don't need to analyze it at all. You should actually just stop looking at it entirely, because all that will do is distress and vex you, gratuitously. So, just forget it. Forget about your lipid panel entirely, and live happily by eating meat, and practically nothing else. It has no bearing on cardiovascular disease risk at all, and we'll get to it, I suspect. She went from a standard diet, or I don't know what her previous diet was, to a carnivore. Okay, it was a vegan diet. Her vegan diet completely destroyed her metabolism and her hormones to the degree that she lost her period for months. She also had extremely chronic acne, which I believe was also painful. I can't, I couldn't imagine it not being painful. And extreme bloating problems as a result of that diet. And a B12 deficiency, I believe. Which, what a shock. I don't know if she was supplementing or not. It also wouldn't surprise me if she was still registering deficient, despite taking one. But whatever. Anyway, that was her previous diet. She says she's been doing this for five years. This is the girl that you see on TikTok. It's a little bit younger. Well, if you have TikTok, which you shouldn't have at all, don't get TikTok. And if you have it, delete it now. And is downing like sticks of butter, eating ribeyes, cheeseburgers, all that now. Yes, she obviously, I have no doubt in my mind that she does that on her own time, off camera. But she especially records it to garner a following in an audience because why wouldn't you? It's sensational. It's egregious. And people like to see it. And the ones that don't like to see it, they still like to comment. I'm, I'm still waiting for people in 2024 to understand that when you don't like something, the last thing you should do is comment on the thing you don't like and engage with it. it it's the most hilarious thing when these people People cannot control their emotions. They have the most incontinent emotional control. It's ridiculous. Just don't comment unless you are trying to debate the person or something. Be like, okay, you, know, you have the courage of your own convictions. We'll come up on the channel. Anyway. Those of you who don't know, I'm Dr. Allo. I'm a board certified cardiologist. Double well, board certified doesn't matter. If anything, that actually takes away from any credibility you could have had bestowed upon you. Of course, if we're going to play devil's advocate and be as objective as possible here, which is important to do, it does depend on when he had that credence bestowed upon him, but he looks quite too young for it to have been during a time where that credence meant anything. Certified. I'm currently in the process of finishing up a book on cholesterol. This will be like the... Well, anyone could write a book. I did, so... It doesn't mean you're right about anything that you're talking about. It's an opinion piece written by authors. In my opinion, my opinion piece is much better than yours. If yours is about cholesterol, knowing what you believe about it. New go-to book on cholesterol that everybody hopefully in the future will be reading and referencing. This is the lipidology textbook for non-cardiologists, for non-lipidologists. So that's kind of my intro. Um, if you like this kind of stuff, follow me for more. But anyways, let's go through her labs and kind of take a look. Don't follow him for more, please, for your own sake, for your own good. Don't do it. See 
where she was before and I'll put the graphic up here where she was before and where she is now now I will mention that she's had a lot of doctors on her program to discuss. So why did you put doctors in quotes there? I already covered this in the last little recording that I did. And each time I watch it, it's more and more offensive. <laughs> this is the second time, but still. Because the doctors she had on her channel, or she has had on her channel, have absolutely had the right and have earned the title of doctor. Doctor is a very broad term nowadays, though. Doctor was, was a very specific thing when it first came to be. A term. Look up the definition of doctor and the etymology of it. Now, it usually is colloquially meaning physician. And physicians are just trained monkeys that are taught to prescribed medication that corresponds to presenting symptomology. This is, of course, with all due respect to ones that aren't like that, of course, like people like Anthony Chafee, who he was going to put up on the screen. He also puts up Dr. Kilt in a second, who absolutely also has earned the title of doctor in the area of being a fertility doctor. So anyway, once again, here here's the first exemplification here of the haughty arrogance you are going to get from Alo in every single video that he posts. Labs and I'll, you know, I'll put a picture of those people up as well. First of all, some of them are not doctors. Um, I so what? Yeah, so he puts up Coach Rebecca on the screen. Rebecca is someone that suffered from extreme disordered eating to the point of near death on multiple occasions in, in the anorexic realm, not the obesity realm. She healed her condition with a carnivorous ketogenic approach, and actually she's not even fully carnivore last time I checked. A while back I saw her making sourdough bread, for example, which I don't know if that was just a very seldom occasion or whatever, but it doesn't matter. So what's your point? Rebecca has never claimed to be a doctor. She's a coach, and I'm sure that she's responsible enough to only call herself a coach because she's certified to be called a coach. Okay, Bella, you put Bella up on the screen. I don't know why you even put her up on the screen because she didn't interview herself, did she? That'd be interesting to watch. Dr. Hampton, I've seen his face around. I'm not sure who he is. But Dr. Chafee covered that. Dr. Kiltz covered that. So what's your point? What was the point in putting in putting doctor in quotations? Dr. Allo. Does that make any sense? Anyway. And guarantee you, none of them are cardiologists. If you look at the list of doctors... So what? Just because you're a cardiologist doesn't mean you know what you're talking about, okay? And also, vice versa. Just because you're not a cardiologist doesn't mean you don't know what you're talking about with respect to the area of cardiovascular disease development. I'm a perfect example of that. I'm not a cardiologist, but I know it better than you do, okay? At the very least, the salient relevant details to cardiovascular disease development. So, anyway, let's continue. Put a picture of them. Not one of these doctors is a cardiologist. None of them is a lipidologist, which means none of them know anything about cholesterol lipidology. Uh, that's actually not necessarily the case because your implication there was that if you're not a lipidologist, you don't know what you're talking about with respect to lipids, and that's not the case. Lipoprotein metabolism is a very complex biochemical lesson. It's a biochemistry lesson, okay? Guess who knows biochemistry? And also basic chemistry, like pH, acid-base balance, or at least the most credible theories as to what that's about. Okay. Alo, your arrogance is already getting the best of you, and it's really sad to see. Really sad to see, because, you know, we need more people in the space of cardiology that are humble and also intelligent. And I don't think you fit any of those criteria, unfortunately, at least in this field, once again. The one that comes the closest is a cardiothoracic surgeon that she brought on. Anybody who works... That's also not to mention, once again, just a final note, that lipidology is not even needed to be understood with respect to heart disease development because the significance of LDL or HDL or any of the lipoproteins and any fraction of the lipoproteins, as well as cholesterol itself, in cardiovascular disease development is basically none. It's nothing. There is not significance there, Alo. Sorry medical field knows that cardiothoracic surgeons know nothing about cholesterol. They're uh, that's not necessarily the case. They're not taught anything about cholesterol in their university teachings. That's different, okay? Because people can learn privately. Even if it's rare, they can. Anyway, Alo already covered all that, so what's next? Good at rearranging your arteries, replacing your valve, but they do that and then they never see you again. They are not... Train. Well, they might see you again if you end up on their table again by exhibiting the exact same behavior. At that point, it's really a matter of time as to whether you'll see your cardiologist next or the coroner next, but whatever. In the long-term care of chronic disease, cholesterol, or any of that. Now, I love cardiothoracic surgeons. I work with them. They are my friends. They do a really, really good job at what- Is that how you talk about your friends? I'm just kidding. And we try to do a really, really good job at what we can do. And when you're not trained in something, one of the first rules in medicine is usually try not to comment on it. So let me put up... Right, or if you don't understand it, actually. It's called the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm, which people have forgotten, including mostly clinicians, actually, that decide to diagnose people with things just based on blood tests when they present with no symptoms. It's a great thing that we see today. ...labs right now, and we'll kind of go through those. Her name is Bella, that's why it's labeled Bella's Lab. So let's go before carnivore, and she actually has this labeled as vegan, so... 
before carnivore here's what her all right so whenever we look at this i'm just going to tell you right now that none of this matters total cholesterol level doesn't matter it's regulated by your genes and nothing else hdl doesn't matter ldl calculated doesn't matter important to note that yes it is calculated it is almost never measured there is a way to measure it but it's never done because it's expensive cholesterol to hdl ratio well now you're just that's a construct no doesn't matter triglycerides okay so that's that's the only thing on this lab panel that is more implying of potential issues. But triglycerides in and of themselves are not a problem. They are not harmful. Triglycerides are simply the storage form of fats, which exist in fatty acid form, you know, chains, and they're just esterified or tied, you could think of it as, bonded to a glycerol molecule. Three fatty acids are esterified to a glycerol molecule, and whenever triglycerides are formed, they are necessarily to be stored for later use. So what? The only reason why triglycerides are better indicators, which is my opinion, and it's, it's a common opinion in this space, of potential issues is because the best way way of raising your triglycerides, which tends to, if chronically elevated, cause you to store excess weight because of what I just said, is by consuming a lot of fructose, which causes damage to the body, consuming a lot of glucose as well, just sugar in general, and just anything that raises your insulin, basically. That's why it's a better indicator, actually. It all goes back to sugar and carbohydrates. So anyway, okay, hemoglobin A1c, unreliable test. It's dependent on so many different things, whether or not it actually implies anything remotely significant in someone's metabolic status with respect to blood glucose control, not blood sugar control, blood glucose control, by the way, Paul Saladino, still waiting for you to actually comment on the fact that you were completely wrong in your video, but your pride gets in the way and your and your money interests. So, you know, CRP, basically inflammatory marker. I'm not really familiar with that test, though. I just know that it's used as a marker of inflammation. Okay, whatever. Vitamin B12, 205, and then it seems to have increased by sevenfold in the carnivore space. Okay, so, so what? Again, really, so what? The only thing of any real significance here is the vitamin B12 and potentially triglycerides. So it seems that now she is replete in vitamin B12. She has finally restored her stores of B12. She was symptomatic uh, with a lot of things, and they could have been tied directly, if not were actually established to be tied directly to B12 deficiency, among other things. So seemed to be in, in an ideal range. Fine. So again, though, so what about the whole lipid panel thing? Who cares? Because sensible people don't care about the lipid panel because they understand its insignificance with respect to the topic that you are expounding upon here, or at least are going to, sir. Allo. Look like, and I'm just going to read these to you. Her total cholesterol was 173. Her H, and, and then maybe we'll just compare them straight to carnivore. So her total cholesterol was 173. On carnivore, it was 365. Her HDL, which if you guys have been watching my stuff for a while, you know that's a nonsense marker. We do not. Uh, really all of them are nonsense markers. They're not markers of f***ing anything. Allo, pardon my well English. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. Who cares? Care what your HDL is. We actually now call that highly disappointing lipoprotein because that's how much we don't care about it it has not shown well you don't care about it and neither do i but neither do i care about ldl and you seem to care about ldl so there's a problem here anyway i've watched this part too but this is right around the part that uh, i realized that my screen recording was not engaged so proven to be cardioprotective and may or may not be and we just uh, there's actually no evidence there's no scientific evidence to show that anything is cardioprotective in the field of human nutrition science because of the fact that that's a cause and effect statement and there are no studies to inform upon any causal relationships as that relates to any aspect of human nutrition as that relates to any dietary or lifestyle intervention over any given period of time throughout the entire time human nutrition science has existed because human nutrition science is based on inferential statistics standard inferential statistics and standard inferential statistics once again and makes no claims about causality, which also means that you can't actually establish something as being atherogenic either, which is a term you may throw around later on. Basically, your entire theology is exactly that. It's theology. It's based upon vapid, unsophisticated, in many cases, bought and paid for associations, and therefore you can derive opinions from them, but that's exactly that. It's your opinion, and honestly, most opinions, especially based on that kind of science, which isn't science at all because science requires experimentation, which requires control, is complete nonsense. It has utility in the areas of things like science psychoanalytic theory. Jordan Peterson is someone in that sphere. He knows how to interpret this science quite well, better than I do, because he's actually taught to interpret science, by the way. But I'm sure that if he heard my commentary, he'd understand that when it comes to establishing what is indicated for human beings to be consuming and how they should be living, well, that is extremely ambiguous. And honestly, there are other factors, there are other sciences that we can point to first and should point to first in order to infer such ideas from, such as biochemistry, such as comparative anatomy, observational and chemical anthropology, Okay, cancer biology, all of that stuff. So anyway, let's continue. We know enough about it. We kind of just ignore that. No, we know enough about it, Allo. We absolutely know enough about it. We know enough to know that not only HDL, but LDL and all the cholesterol markers have no bearing on one's heart disease or cardiovascular disease risk whatsoever because we know the physiology behind that. Okay, and we'll get into it. 
based on the current status of the data, it's generally not important at this point in time. Neither of them are. None of them are. Okay. Now I'm just, I'm just beating it at horse here. The next one is her LDL and she puts it in quotation marks that it is calculated, which is fine for the vast majority of people. Unless your LDL is super, super low and you're on statin therapy, it's pretty accurate. So hers initially was statin therapy. Did you actually just call statin administration therapy as if it's therapeutic at all? Although I would recommend since we were on the topic of associations and that seems to be all that you care about, or at least all you know how to interpret or well, pretend to know how to interpret because you actually don't know how to even responsibly interpret associations in the area of human nutrition science, you should look into the association association, the extremely glaringly obvious reasonings behind as well, the association, the vast association between basically statin taking populations and the presentation within those populations of ALS, an invariably fatal condition, neurological condition. It's the thing that got Stephen Hawking, but most people actually don't live as long as Stephen Hawking do with that condition. They die much earlier. It's the entire reason why we had the ALS ice bucket challenge, because it's supposed to represent how they feel paralyzed. That association is the exact same, if not a stronger association, that is seen within populations that smoke and presentations within those populations of lung cancer. What is that association? The epidemiological association that we're speaking about here is a relative increase of 11,800% roughly. And if you actually understand even a lick of pharmacology when it comes to statins, you understand why they are absolute metabolic poisons and toxins, and you understand why they would lead to nerve degeneration generation and also muscle degeneration and muscle mass reduction, because that's also what it does. It's almost as if every single one of the trillions of cells in your body are constituted or composed of cholesterol. If I didn't say cell membrane specifically, well then yeah, it's cell membrane specifically. So the entire outermost exterior structure of cells are composed of cholesterol. And what is the f***ing thing that transfers and transports cholesterol to tissues of the body? Well, you've got VLDL, but also um, LDL. That's the primary one after IDL goes back to the liver and whatever it does its thing, to put it simply, okay? Goodness me. You can drop your LDL level as calculated to single digits by taking statin medications. And that is criminal. And that is dangerous, okay? Because we know the importance of LDL, so we can say that an extremely low level, close to zero, is not only dangerous, but lethal, okay? That's why I say that levels don't matter, but if anything, the closer you get to zero, that actually is more dangerous. That's dangerous. If it's super high, it can be indicative of other things occurring. It is still not cholesterol that is the problem because the production of it is regulated by ER genes. So yes, if your LDL, your HDL, or anything is extremely high, it could be indicative of a problem. Yes. But if it's a true problem, well, then you'll start to experience symptoms. Okay? Once again, to, to invoke the Hippocratic Oath here of do no harm, you do not tell people to do things things, or even arguably recommend that they do things, but that, that's more ambiguous though. You don't prescribe them something as a clinician if they present with no symptoms, but you see abnormalities in their blood test results as compared to normative levels of the population, that population being heavily deranged. It's irresponsible and it is actively breaking the Hippocratic Oath. Anyway, let's continue. He won on vegan and now it is 264. Her cholesterol to HDL ratio, I don't even know why that's listed. That's no, that's not a marker of concern. Her no, it's not. I covered that. Cholesterides went from 97 to 15, and we'll talk about why that may have happened. Her hemoglobin A1C went from 5. .5. Well, it's probably because she stopped consuming all the sugar. I'd guarantee it. Also, insulin is a heavy hormonal regulator, a very significant one, to use an actual technical term, of acetyl-CoA carboxylase activity, the very enzyme that exists to create fatty acids to then be a sterified diglycerol to form triglycerides in liver and fat cells. So quite, you know, pre-diabetic to 4.7, which generally so pre-diabetic, even on a vegan diet, that's actually impressive because vegans, they tend to actually ameliorate their diabetes and pre-diabetes. But of course, it's arguable what you mean by ameliorate because that's based on thresholds. So it just depends on where you put your threshold as to whether someone ameliorated their diabetes or not. So anyway, but yeah, okay. If we're going to use the thresholds that have been employed or, or established really, so opined to be the best. Sure. Yeah. And that's honestly, it's impressive, but it's also not surprising at the same time, because I said in my last video that I did with respect to type one diabetes and plant based diets efficacy to ameliorate such a thing. Please go ahead and check that out. That was one of the first videos that I just now uploaded that is uncut or at least minimally cut. I do sometimes blah, blah, stumble over my words or a word. So there are like one or two here and there. Please let me know what you guys think about that style, please. But anyway, I said in that video something. I can't even remember what I was saying. Wow. You know what? I should probably just shut up and watch the video.
resistant, but definitely nowhere near, you know, the pre-diabetic range at all. And you could probably just... So you just invoked insulin resistance, and I would assume that you actually have no idea what that actually is in terms of its etiology or the mechanisms as to why that even occurs. If you want to learn more about that, check out the video I did with Bart K recently, or go ahead and check out the video, the response video I did to Ben Bickman, which I've already referenced earlier in the video. Take her off the pre-diabetes range. CRP went from non-existent to 0 0.3. Again, not really a marker we care that much about. I'm not sure why that was even checked. 0 0.3 is also, it depends on what, is it in milligrams? Is it in nanograms? I mean, it doesn't, in millimoles, it doesn't really say, but generally if I'm thinking what she's, the normal way that we report it in the United States, um, 0 0.3 is not really concerning. It is higher. And we know that red meat and saturated fat is very pro-inflammatory. No, you don't know that. And there's your first f***ing mistake. And you just said it so flagrantly. It was, it's honestly laughable and embarrassing that you just said that. Pro-inflammatory is another cause and effect claim. And I just covered how you cannot establish that in the science that you were very clearly tacitly referring to. Okay? You can't establish that. And if you do see that there are associations with many different confounders, but if we're just going to be forgiving as possible, or as forgiving as possible, that as you increase saturated to fat and LDL levels increase and all that stuff, you see an increase in inflammation as derived from inflammatory markers. So it depends on the veracity of those. But once again, let's just be as forgiving as possible and say that those are necessarily indicative of active inflammation occurring in some form or another for some reason or another. Was that in the context of a no carbohydrate diet? Because what we also know based on biochemistry and biology, allo, is that if a cell is attempting to oxidize glucose and fatty acids, particularly the mitochondria actually, hence the term oxidized, because that's what actually does the oxidation. There's sort of, to be analogous, there's a there's a door jam and it lowers the redox potential of the overall cell, the mitochondria, and then the overall cell. And that necessarily causes inflammation because of a decrease in ATP concentration and therefore a commensurate increase in inorganic phosphate concentrations, which actively activates pro-inflammatory cytokines. That's biochemistry though, Allo. And therefore I can invoke the word cause here. So yes, that causes inflammation. So if you dump a bunch of carbohydrates and fat down your neck, well, what a shock that you see inflammation occur. But again, those studies that you're referring to tacitly have no ability to inform upon causal relationships. So your word pro-inflammatory is completely irresponsible and absolutely evincing of your incompetence when it comes to interpreting science. Just because you're a cardiologist does not mean that you know how to interpret science. It also doesn't mean that you know anything about actual cardiology and etiology behind heart disease, by the way. And we'll get to that. Probably all the doctors that she interviewed did not tell her that much. Yeah, so there's your little snarky, sarcastic response because you're an offensive ass who wants to cast aspersions because you believe yourself to be superior to these people morally and also intellectually. It's called Dunning-Kruger. You should look that up. And B12, again, not really uh, something of concern, at least definitely not to a cardiologist. So let's go through these one by one, especially the ones that really make a, make a difference. So her total cholesterol. None of those really make a difference at all. And I already covered why, or at least the changes from vegan to carnivore. It doesn't matter, Allo. If anything, higher cholesterol is probably better. And even if it weren't, well, it actually necessarily is indicated because her genes are encoding for it. So it's indicated given the circumstances. Necessarily because we know how genes work. That's cell biology. Goodness. Went up to 365. It was 173. The normal now for total cholesterol. Why do we care? Whatever you're going to say. Why do we care what the normal level is? The normal population is deranged metabolically. So who cares? Okay. That goes for ferritin. That goes for even fasting blood glucose and fasting insulin, honestly. Okay. NA1Cs. I don't care about that. It's time for a paradigm shift, Allo. If these people don't have symptoms, leave them alone. Does Bella have symptoms? No. And not only does she not have symptoms, she's living the best life that she has metabolically in years. So, so much for the anti-inflammatory plant foods and, and the lack of the pro-inflammatory saturated fat. So much for that, Allo. Is 150, the new highest cutoff we want people generally. Yeah, how dare people put a cutoff on cholesterol levels? I mean, how dare they, really? If the body were a living thing and I were that body, I'd be offended. How dare you question my methods by which I regulate homeostasis based on billions of years of experience? How dare you do that? You, someone that's lived for less than a century, anyway be under 150. Now, this is not a hard target because generally speaking, there's no data or not enough data 
to support a target for treatment for okay you don't know how to interpret data and you wouldn't know data really and how to interpret it if the methods by which one should interpret it hit you upside the chin Allah. okay so stop pretending like you know how to interpret science you just said in the beginning of the video that these cardiothoracic surgeons shouldn't be talking about lipidology and cardiology and therefore the etiology behind heart disease and how to prevent it with diet because they're not trained in it and yet here you are saying that since you're a cardiologist and a lipidologist you can therefore interpret science and therefore comment about it hypocrisy much arrogance much cognitive dissonance much cholesterol but generally speaking if you're under 150 about 70 to 80 percent of that is usually ldl cholesterol and ldl cholesterol isn't cholesterol it's a lipoprotein transporter for cholesterol let's be accurate okay there are not different forms of cholesterol there are different forms of lipoproteins and they all have a purpose and they all serve a purpose and they're all encoded by the genes of the body given the circumstances those genes having evolved for billions of years and therefore have the experience to know exactly what the f they should be doing I'll put you around the 100 mark and that is actually the goal of goal of therapy or the target for no that's your goal of therapy and it's criminal and i just covered why it's criminal how dare you tell the body basically what it should be doing and shouldn't be doing really the genes of the body the things that make us who we are individually it's amazing truly everyday folks with a normal uh, with a normal lifestyle, no sickness, no illness, no chronic disease, no atherosclerosis, no heart disease, no heart attacks or strokes. Normally, we want most people under 100. If uh, yeah, it doesn't matter what you want. Okay. You guys also want people to take statins. I believe, I'm not in this arena and I don't have experience in that arena. Clip that, Alo, for your response video. I'm not in this arena and I don't have experience in that arena. It's possible that you guys are actually incentivized monetarily to prescribe statin medications. I think that very well might be the case. It actually may be stupid of me to even question that. There might be a lot of you being like, Eddie, no shit. But I actually, I honestly don't even look into that. All I know is that they encourage that they're prescribed and they shouldn't be. So, you know, but if they're incentivized, well, that just makes it even worse. So yes, if you are incentivized, then yes, you personally also want people to take statins. You want to find any excuse for people to take statins. That's not the case. And I humbly apologize. Look at her labs from before. Her LDL cholesterol was actually 81. Now, who cares? And also it's not cholesterol. Covered that. Young, healthy person that's otherwise doing very well. No atherosclerosis, never had a heart attack or stroke, no family history, no diabetes, none of that stuff. Although you could maybe make the argument on the diabetes on her, but generally speaking... And, and why is that? Because she was vegan, so perhaps it's the sugar? Because that's the underpinning cause of type 2 diabetes is sugar consumption, particularly glucose consumption, actually, because it's inferred from blood glucose readings, even though that is not the only sugar that wreaks havoc in the body. Anyway. Cholesterol of 81, we'd probably just leave it alone. Now, if you're one of these people that wants longevity... Yeah, if anything, 81's too low, but whatever. It was set by her genes, and if she's having symptoms based on her diet, then she should just change her diet, and her cholesterol levels will regulate accordingly. Health span and lifespan, and you want to optimize everything, yeah, you probably want to be under 55, and some people... That's your opinion. And also, it's once again predicated upon erroneous and fallacious information, and also, in many cases, fraudulent. We might be able to get into that later as well. 40, the latest guidelines do state... Well, who cares about what the guidelines are and what they say? Because the guidelines are opinions that were put forth and opined by consensus. That consensus being composed of, well, the authorities in the health sphere and the mainstream health establishment that profits off of sickness and drugs. So who the f*** cares? Also, food companies that get most of their money by making very cheap products. The cheapest ones being sugar and corn and grain-based products that are all conducive. From every biochemical inference, we can say that they're the most conducive to causing, down the line some sort of metabolic derangement. Yes, I use the word cause there, responsibly. Or you're having multiple ischemic events, whether they're strokes or heart attacks, revascularization, open heart surgery, whatever, then you definitely want to be under 40. Under that's your opinion, Alo. And if anything, actually, that's completely f false. You want your body to do exactly what it's supposed to do given the circumstances with respect to cholesterol production and lipoprotein production. And if you try and interfere with that, you are doing a disservice to that person's individual genes and their physiology, therefore. And you should be ashamed of yourself. No cholesterol. Um, in her case, she's not had any of these things. You could argue plus or minus one risk factor, you know. She... There are no such things as established risk factors in human nutrition science because risk is also a cause and effect statement. Look at all six definitions of risk in the New Oxford English Dictionary and you'll find that yes, they are all implications of causality. The only time that it's not is whenever you talk about finances where you say, oh, there's a risk here. But that's actually just a shortening of the full sentence that says you risk potentially losing or gaining profits. So 
it's still responsible to say that because all of it is all potential. Yes, of course you risk potentially doing something. You risk potentially doing anything, so still it's representative of causality. You can't say that. Rewind my video, Alo. In her mind, um, slightly overweight at, and has lost weight and in she was uh, weight is not a risk factor it's not even in my opinion a good idea to say that it may be a risk factor obesity and an overweight status is not the cause effectively of anything it's definitely not the root cause of anything because what caused that person to become obese and overweight is at least closer to discovering the root cause of the issue that is a symptom of poor dietary input almost invariably at the very least hormonal imbalances caused by something external or perhaps perhaps some sort of, in very rare circumstances, genomic issues. But then that's anomalous and therefore shouldn't be extrapolated to the normal population at large. That is genetically optimal. In the pre-diabetic range at least, or you know, very and quite insulin resistant, and now that has... <sighs> insulin resistance is a construct and therefore you can't measure that. It's a construct that is based upon proxy measures, which means that in order to establish if someone is insulin resistant, you are inferring that from blood glucose readings and corresponding insulin readings. Fasting, okay? And that's plus or minus a lot actually, and you, we really shouldn't even be looking at insulin resistance in the first place. Are you eating carbohydrates and fat at the same time? Are you experiencing symptoms as a result of that? Well, cut the carbohydrates because they're the one macronutrient that isn't actually a macronutrient. It's a macrotoxin and it's not necessary for human survival. And if you are someone that has extreme metabolic derangement from something like oxalate toxicity, you may need some. You may need to use glucose as a drug just like other people need to use a pharmacological intervention for a certain derangement. Sure, you use it as a drug and even then you don't need to go up to 100 grams a day. It's usually about like 10 to 20 that people need. Sally K. Norton is a perfect example of this. Okay, so even then <laughs> I try to keep mine under 20 and I do a pretty good job of that. I should really be keeping mine at zero because I'm not one of the people that I was just speaking about, but you know me. Improved, and we'll get into that in a second. The next number that was listed um, is this ratio. Cholesterol to HDL ratio is not a number of concern. A lot of people want to say, well, my triglycerides to HDL is this, and my total cholesterol to HDL. Cover all this. None of them are. Is that my LDL cholesterol to HDL cholesterol is this. Using HDL in any denominator or, or numerator is incorrect and invalid. The eight. That's your opinion, and I concur with that. I corroborate that opinion, but it's probably based upon different things. I'm basing it upon my knowledge in biochemistry and also the true etiology behind heart disease. You're basing it off of ridiculous inferential statistics that can't inform upon f***ing anything, and it's therefore bred in circuses. From the mainstream medical establishment, with the intended audience being we the people, okay? I don't have a whole chapter about this in my new cholesterol book. If you want it, go to drallo.net slash cholesterol. You can don't do that. Don't do that at all. Go buy my book, Contraindicated, please. Or once again, check out the playlist on my channel. That's the best thing that I can tell you to do. To be the first to know when it's going to come out, we are like this close. Uh, we're just going through some final edits. Um, it is a book that has been endorsed by some of the biggest names in lipidology, cardiac. Okay, so appeal to consensus and authority. Good, that's a fallacy, both of those, so no one cares. Be the president of Europe. I mean, I mean, just for example, when have the experts not failed us in the last 10 years especially? Expert is a vapid term. It has really no meaning anymore. Anyone can call themselves experts about anything. Even health influencers online now are calling themselves experts. I've been called an expert recently by a few people. I appreciate it, and I'm not telling people to necessarily stop if you believe that I'm an expert. Go ahead and say that. I, I would encourage people to be careful throwing that term around, though. That's all I would say. I do appreciate it, but that should tell you that anyone can be called an expert. Some people earn it based on their, you know, demonstration of of competence, perspicacity, and sagaciousness in certain fields. And other people are given that by an institution that is filled with rapaciousness and misanthropy and cupidity, okay? In atherosclerotic society, um, some of the biggest names in cardiology that you see online, whether they're on here or TikTok or any other uh, place that you can find them, this is like the biggest, you know, uh, greatest, you know, but one of the cardiologists that, I, that said this is going to be the, the most important book of our time. And there's obviously... Well, that's their opinion. And also that seems like they're being extremely unctuous, ingratiatingly flattering and oily to you. Okay. Did you pay him to say that? Lots of people on there. Danielle Bellardo, Dr. Thomas Dayspring, uh, Dr. Professor Kausik Ray. Never heard of these people. And frankly, I don't care. 
Lay Norton, in Matthew Nag. What? Okay, well there you go. Matthew Nagra is worse, and then and then you've got Lay Norton on there. Good. So Lay Norton, one of the most petulant, querulous children that I've ever had to deal with on this channel. Oh yeah, he's got big muscles, and he could beat my ass if we were standing in front of each other. Good thing it's online, and therefore you can't use brute force to you know rule with an iron fist and shut down opinions that you don't like being heard about yourself and also everything that you promulgate. Every single behavior tactic that he holds and actually exhibits is that of a child, a four-year-old child. Yell at people when you don't get your way. Fail to be able to even use your words when you are yelling and make cogent arguments and basically think that you're the greatest person to ever walk the face of the fucking earth. Obviously, that's an exaggeration, but he has narcissistic mentality and it's a shame that people like him have such large followings. I've done two videos on Lane before, I believe, if not three. You should go check those out. Yeah, I've done three. One of them is a Patreon exclusive though, so go ahead. Subscribe to the Patreon if you want to see that third one. Anyway. Alan Aragon, Simon Hill... So Simon Hill, another problem, another red flag there. Good. Thanks for telling us this, though, so that we can actually look out for that and avoid buying your book. Um, Ron Grisanti, Terry Simpson, Matthew... Terry Simpson. There's another problem. Terry Simpson, I've also critiqued on this channel twice. Possibly more arrogant than Lane Norton and Alo combined, actually. A one, frankly. I mean, if we're going to be talking about who promoted whose book, my book, for example, was promoted by Dr. Jaquish on his page. It was promoted by Bart K. a few times, who I'm talking to about writing my foreword for the second edition. Honestly, those two names alone should tell you, hey, maybe you should buy that book if you haven't already. So again, let's have a book war here. Allo's promoting his, I'll promote mine again, emphatically. Allo, we get it. Oops. Um, the list is quite long. Oh, Patty, Patty, Dr. Patty Barrett. Okay, well, quantity does not equate to quality. For example, Bart K and Dr. Jaquish promoted my book. That's only two people, but their credibility combined trounces all of these people, I would suspect. There's many people on here that I don't know, though, so. But if they're promoting his book, and if they're anything like, uh, Lane Norton and Terry Simpson and Matthew Nagra, oh, Dr. Idris Mogul, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I've seen him around. He's a vegan doctor. There you go. There's a problem. Simon Hill, Dr. Nagra. Good stuff. Wow. Um, trying to think some more. Anyways, this is a really long list. Maybe I'll just put the names up here, but you can go to dralo.net slash cholesterol and get to that. So ratios don't matter. Whether it's triglycerides, neither do these numbers. And I already covered that. Next. I mean, look at this. We're eight minutes and 17 seconds into the video. We're almost halfway done. And he hasn't talked about why these numbers are scary. They're not scary, but why he thinks they're scary. He hasn't talked about anything. So hopefully we get into the meat and more meat, not potatoes right now. Yeah. Total cholesterol to HDL. LDL to HDL, whatever, anything with HDL or any ratio in your lipid panel is not concerning at all. Correct. And neither is LDL and HDL in isolation. So next. Whatsoever, based on everything that we know in 2024. So just to let you guys know that. Now, the next number she reports is her triglycerides. They went from 97 to 15. Now, 97, anything over about 70-ish you're probably insulin resistant. Now, there are ways to test. Okay, that is an opinion, and I'm going to be as forgiving as possible here because I like to do that even to my worst enemies. Yes, elevated triglycerides, once again, tend to be indicative of metabolic dysfunction in some way, and I just explained that earlier in the video. If you didn't understand that, please rewind. That's what I'd recommend doing, and I just explained that it's because of the sugar consumption, basically. However, the reason why you must state that it is not necessarily a problem is because, first of all, triglycerides, once again, just necessarily, they are not harmful. Harmful. Triglycerides are not harmful at all. They don't damage tissues. They don't do any of that. They're just fats to be stored. They're packaged forms of fat. You can also see in ketogenic carnivorous people, particularly muscular men we've seen in case studies, which really aren't even case studies. They were like sort of case reports. There wasn't that much studying done on them though. One of them I wrote about in the first edition of my book. I cut it out in the second edition only because of the fact that it actually just really doesn't have any relevance. There's no point in talking about it that much. I put way too much emphasis on it. There was no point. It was about a man who was very muscular and he was very ostensibly fat adapted and he exhibited elevated triglycerides. They were in the hundreds. It was below 200. I'm, I'm not saying that it was that high. I'm just saying it was over 100. The problem was he had no excess adiposity on him, very little adiposity in general on him, and he was extremely muscular. He also reported not eating sugar. And of course, given his presentation, you can assume that he's probably telling the truth. And if he is eating sugar, it's very minimal. So what's the problem there? If there was a problem, which there wasn't, by the way, he didn't present with any symptoms. But if there was a problem, he was probably eating too much protein because that's converted into more glucose, which is usually converted when it's present in excess into triglycerides. Well, well, fatty acids, then a sterified to a glycerol molecule, triglyceride is formed, goes to an adipocyte. So once again, actually it goes back to glucose, but therefore you cannot say that it is necessarily representative of some sort of pathology occurring. That pathology with respect to this issue being, well, carbohydrate consumption, actually. Anyway, just wanted to get that out there.
tests and check this one of them is actually an a1c and hers was fine oh, that's conditional go ahead once again and check out my suresh karadkar video that i did which i covered blood tests extensively and pretty much sums up everything in the conclusion of the video for example the hippocratic oath states that if someone does not present with symptoms you are obligated to not intervene in those circumstances done we are done wow and hers was 5.5 on the vegan diet but also People are now thinking, oh, well, if I just go carnivore, I can get rid of diabetes. No, you can't. Uh, yes, you can. Yes, you can, Alo. Absolutely irresponsible and obstinate. Bordering on perverse, because you know that that's true. You absolutely know that that's true. To actively just tell people to their f***ing face on this video that going carnivore cannot, you just use the word can't, fix their diabetes. Absolutely nonsensical. Ridiculous, irresponsible, and you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Absolutely ignoble and squalid of you, sir what happened so this person is uh is got the genes for diabetes and if you don't understand got the genes for diabetes certain genes or presentations of genes make it to where your propensity or the threshold that you would have to attain or surpass in order to develop diabetes let's say type 2 diabetes is higher however at the end of the day the cause of type 2 diabetes is carbohydrate consumption to some degree and therefore even if that person has the genes that make it more likely that given the same stimulus as someone else that does not present with those genes that they will present with diabetes and develop it that does not mean that they will necessarily develop it okay Alo? This still, I mean, the fact that you just nonchalantly, perfunctorily said, no, you can't. You can't. You can't ameliorate diabetes with carnivore diet. Absolutely false. And you know that's false, which makes it even worse. You absolutely know that that's false. Ridiculous. Alo? Wow, the f***ing temerity to say that. And if you don't understand diabetes, go watch some of my lectures on here on diabetes. No, if you don't understand diabetes, which you clearly don't, Alo, then you should read my book and also look at my lecture-like reaction videos on diabetes, actually. I have a playlist about diabetes as well. There's insulin resistance to diabetes and carbohydrate and diabetes. Watch both of those playlists, okay? I understand diabetes. You don't, Alo. You actually don't understand it very clearly. Because if you did, you'd understand that, um, oh yeah, diabetes is characterized exclusively and explicitly as chronically elevated blood glucose and nothing else. The pathology is the glycation that occurs, the excessive glycation of bodily tissues by glucose molecules, and also others, by the way, via the covalent binding of those molecules to other proteins in your body, such as your albumin in your blood plasma. Goodness me. You must have the genetics for diabetes in order to get diabetes. So if you don't... That's ridiculous, Alo. So basically what you're saying is that diet has no bearing on one's risk for diabetes development. You heard it here, folks. From Dr. Alo himself. From the horse's mouth. Really? The genes for insulin resistance or diabetes, you're not going to magically get those genes. Insulin resistance is not a genetic issue, Alo. What the hell are you talking about? or magically get diabetes. You must have the genetics for diabetes. There are 17 alleles at least that we know of. And that was back in like the early 2000s that we knew of the 17 alleles, there's way more. Notice how it says associated with type two diabetes, by the way. I mean, let's just say they were causally associated. That once again goes back to what I just said. That will raise the propensity for someone to develop diabetes given the same stimuli, stimulus or stimuli, as compared to someone else that does not present with those genes or at least presents with far less of those. That doesn't mean they will necessarily develop diabetes because at the end of the day, diabetes type two is characterized by chronically elevated blood glucose and nothing else. And the way to achieve that and develop it is through carbohydrate consumption to some degree. Allo. You cannot exhibit truly pathological type 2 diabetes without consuming carbohydrates. I don't care if you're consuming and guzzling seed oils. Once again, that's another factor that seems to, given the mechanisms as to why we know this, lower the threshold that one would have to attain or surpass in order to develop diabetes because of the inflammation that it causes. Inflammation itself is what we're really talking about. But without the consumption of carbohydrates to some degree, you will not develop diabetes. The only time, if I'm going to play devil's advocate, the only time that you could really have that happen is if you're extremely distressed and your liver is pumping out a lot of glucose and cortisol as a result of that. Usually not in that order, cortisol and then glucose. Okay. But still at the end of the day, if your liver is producing the glucose, that is determined by your genes to be necessary. So that is not the root cause. Your body will not produce glucose. It does not need. Okay. So even then tackle the underlying issue, which is inflammation. You want a great way of ameliorating inflammation? Carnivore diet seems to be the absolute most conducive way, the most propitious approach to doing such a thing. If you need an extra punch or an extra kick in your life, or if you have the privilege of doing this, because honestly, no one should not be doing this, refer to the link on the bottom of the screen and invest in Cerule products. Don't just buy them, learn about them first.
top right corner of the screen. Or refer to the description below to find an interview between myself and Professor Barquet on those products in further detail, as well as the company of Cerule itself, so that you know that you can trust where your money is going. Okay? Anyway. We now. But you must have... Still, by the way, still waiting. Nine minutes and 38 seconds into this video. Still waiting for why you're shocked by her cholesterol results. Still waiting as to, uh, for why you actually believe that this is a problem. Because you haven't even brought this to the forefront. Okay? Diabetes genes or the insulin resistance genes to get diabetic. Now, she states that she was overweight. She was about 20 pounds overweight on vegan, has lost weight, her skin cleared up, you know, all this stuff. And now... She feels so much better that she's on carnivore. She lost those 20 pounds and all her numbers got better. Yeah, and before you even finish that sentence, if someone came to me and said that that's how they feel on their vegan diet or vegetarian diet, you know what I'd say to them? I'd say, fantastic, because that's what matters. What I would also tell them, if they were willing to be open to it in the most humble and respectful way possible is, well, that's good. I'm not someone that agrees with that approach, but I will not deny your experience. If you want to learn more about my approach and the way I think, you should read my book or something. It's the actually the entire reason I wrote the book. I, I'm not just trying to find ways to plug in the book just to make a quick buck. It's because there's so much here in order to actually put it in a, in a nice orderly picture. I had to write a book. So that's what I would tell people. That's why the book exists. Or I would tell them to, you know, watch my channel. Although that would probably be the second thing I tell them to do, given how I act on my videos. Womp womp. All her numbers got better with the exception of one or two, which we'll talk about. When you lose weight, regardless of how you lose it, it doesn't matter what diet you do. Go watch my lectures on here. They're very long. Don't watch his lectures. I've never watched them and I never will, probably, unless someone recommends that I do so. Don't be afraid to recommend it to me. If you want me to, I'll do it, but I'm not going to do it unless I have to, so. On, and I'm talking, I'm referring to YouTube in case you're listening to this on audio. Go watch my YouTube lectures on weight loss. There's like a three hour you know, lecture. There's a entire weight loss playlist. It's actually cool. Well, stop focusing on weight loss. Start focusing on the reason why someone is overweight and obese and then tell them to fix that because then weight will fall in the line. Okay. Also, when you say weight loss, be careful with that because that means that necessarily all weight loss is a good thing. Okay. Well, if you cut off your leg right now, you lose weight. Is that a good thing? No. If you massively dehydrate yourself, is that a good thing? No, but you lost weight. If you lose all your muscle mass because you stop eating protein, but your fat content stays the same because you're still eating a bunch of carbohydrates, if not increasing it. If your weight goes down on a scale, is that still a good thing? No. No, because your body composition is no longer optimal. Okay, so stop talking about weight loss. Be specific. You mean fat and water loss in excess. Excess fat and water loss. Excess fat and excess water loss. Loss of excess fat and excess water. There we go. Wow. English, man. The ultimate weight loss playlist. If you get through all those videos, you will have a PhD in weight loss. That is ridiculous. <laughs> So this man believes that he has a PhD in weight loss. What is that? What is that anyway? What the hell are you talking about? Oh, the arrogance, the haughty <laughs> arrogance. Wow, Alo. Goodness me. Good stuff. She lost those 20 pounds. That's what made the triglycerides go down. And that's what... No, it didn't, Alo. What the f*** are you talking about? If you knew anything about biochemistry, you'd understand how that makes absolutely no sense. Having excess adiposity on the body is not what causes an increase in triglycerides. It's actually the opposite. Remember, Alo, whenever I said in the beginning of this video, basically, I mean, not explicitly, I'll explicitly state it now, that association does not equal causation? <laughs> Goodness me. How would excess fat on someone's body raise their triglyceride levels? How would that happen? The triglycerides are stored in fat cells. They're not in the blood, in VLDL molecules. That's not how... Wow. Can you believe this, folks? This is amazing. And even on top of that, if that person were to break down their triglycerides, let's say, let's say that since they have a lot of fat on their bodies, if they're in a fasted state, their triglyceride levels are going to be elevated because they have more fat to break down. When you break down triglycerides, they don't convert into triglycerides. So therefore, they wouldn't raise your triglyceride level. They break down into glycerol and non-esterified fatty acids carried by albumin and blood plasma. So it would raise your NIFA level, perhaps, and glycerol, if you cared to measure that, which I don't know why you would, but it would not raise your trigs. This is basic biochemistry. Association does not equal causation. That's the takeaway here. So basically the takeaway of this video is that the most trite, hackneyed, banal claim that you learn in, I learned it in high school, is something that Alo and other doctors still do not understand. Amazing. And now to add to my distress here, there's a squirrel living in our walls here in the apartment. And so now I have to listen to it clawing at our bathtub. <laughs> It, it's it's now our friend because it's lived here for so long. So yes, there's a squirrel living in our in our walls. But don't worry, pest control will be here in a few months. So, A1C, go down. Now, 
at a 5.5, most of you doctors are looking at me like, 5.5 is not diabetic. No, it's not diabetic. 5.7 is pre-diabetic. Above 6.5 is diabetic. Now, these are arbitrary. Yeah, and I think that those, uh, well, he actually just said it, arbitrary. They're arbitrary cutoffs. That's important to recognize. It's an opinion. I think that this should be lower. And I think a better way of inferring someone's, basically, glycation rate is actually with a fructosamine assay. You know, the thing to understand here is that the human body will always incur glycation damage, even from endogenously produced glucose. It's the entire reason why your HbA1c will never hit 0%. It still happens. You can't avoid it, which may seem a little backwards, like why would it happen? Well, I mean, think of any machine, if we're going to compare a body to a machine. Every machine wears down because of something. Metal rusts, even oxygen that we breathe in will still cause oxidative stress. So don't think of it as something that's like counterproductive. Every machine rusts and wears down. We'll always sustain some glycation damage. It always will happen. But the best way of inferring whether that glycation rate is in excess is by using a fructosamine assay. But then you still have to establish an arbitrary cutoff for what that rate is. So what the best thing to do is, is to understand that, well, we need glucose to survive. We create all the glucose we need endogenously via gluconeogenesis. Exogenous carbohydrates are therefore not required, and above a physiological concentration within the bloodstream, exogenous carbohydrates, or uh, carbohydrates in general, really, if we're going to be accurate, are toxic. So therefore, just cut them out. I mean, you're not going to sustain excess glycation damage from glucose if you're not consuming it, unless it's a very fringe example where you're under extreme amounts of inflammation from something else, and therefore your liver is producing it. But guess what? In that circumstance, the liver needs to produce it. It recognizes that it needs to. So still not a problem with respect to diabetes because that's not the root problem, at least. I'm hoping that all this is making sense. That's why stop even looking at the arbitrary cutoffs. Who cares? I'm not eating carbs, so what, what matters here? <sighs> Are you guys having fun yet? Cutoffs. We could have chosen a lower number once we started using A1C for diagnosis, but they didn't want to use a lower number because they didn't want to include a whole host of new people under the definition of diabetes. She is zero point. Oh, yeah, I'm sure that's why they did it. I mean, if that's why they did it, then that's interesting. It probably subserves some other self-interest because if they can get more people under their belt to prescribe medication to, I'm sure that they would have no problem doing that. So two percentage points, 0.2 percent away from being pre-diabetic. So she has insulin resistance genes. If she were to gain weight, even eating carnivore. OK, we covered this. You actually have no idea if that's the case or not. Hello. But even if we just give it to you just for fun, it doesn't matter. The underpinning etiology of type 2 diabetes is still the same, no matter who you are, no matter what your genes are. It's exogenous carbohydrate intake to some degree. That degree will vary depending on who you are. And the frequency required with respect to the consumption of it will also vary depending on the person. It's one of the reasons why children can develop develop type 2 diabetes and why other people it takes longer. I don't have these diabetes genes. I would guarantee that I don't. What I mean is that whenever I was younger, I ate all the sugar you can imagine. And not only did I not develop diabetes, I remained thin. So anyway. Eat only butter and steak and ate 10,000 calories of that a day or whatever it was. Well, you can't eat calories, Allo. And I'm going to be trivially captious here because, well, frankly, your gratuitous aspersion casting beforehand and therefore your exemplification of haughty, ignorant arrogance or arrogant ignorance, that doesn't really deserve a lot of my respect or anyone's for that matter. So no, you don't eat calories. You can't do that. It's a physical impossibility. No. And you also don't yield calories that are used in metabolic processes from your food. You also don't directly yield energy from your food, Allo, because E equals MC squared. If you directly yielded energy from your food, you would be effulgent and would combust every time that you ate anything or drank even a sip of water, actually. Okay. You don't consume calories. That's not, that's not what happens. So no, false. And gains those 20 pounds back, which is not hard to do. She will absolutely uh, go back. Uh, it's actually very difficult to do on a carnivore diet, which is what you're implying is not difficult because, oh, if you just raise your calories because it's just calories in, calories out, guys. Mm -hmm. Well, then, of course, she'll go right back to gaining those 20 pounds. Yeah. Okay. So, first of all, let's just say that you could eat calories and we're using that as an accurate measurement of food intake. Try and eat 10,000 calories of steak and butter, Allo. which, by the way, I mean, you may be able to get more down because I think you need it. You absolutely do need it. It's my very not humble opinion, actually. Anyway, try and do that. I'd love to see how far you get. Yeah. So even if the calories in, calories out model were extremely accurate because the first law of thermodynamics was somehow applicable to human beings, at least sufficiently applicable, well, the carnivore diet is still going to be conducive to losing the weight then in the form of fat and water, especially because you can't get that much down with meat and fat. So if you are someone that wants to still believe in that model, well, that's the other reason why carnivore works still. It will still work in that model because, well, you can't f fit all that food down. She will absolutely uh, go back to being insulin resistance with high triglycerides. No, she won't actually uh, because the whole insulin resistance phenomenon that you're referring to only becomes a problem. It actually never becomes a problem because it isn't a problem. But the only time that it will be seen or perceived to be a problem is whenever someone consumes glucose.
because the actual pathology is glycation damage in excess, really, is what we should say, because we're always sustaining glycation damage. Glycation damage in excess. The expeditious rate of glycation damage to red blood cells and other tissues, such as your albumin and muscle cells and all the other stuff, but really the epithelial cells lining your arteries and to a lesser extent the veins and red blood cells. And then once again, the proteins in your blood plasma. So yeah, anyway. And generally low HDL. Um, in that case, because... Well, who cares about the HDL? We covered that in the beginning, didn't we? Still waiting for you to talk about why these results were scary. Way, you know, when you have triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, especially like H HDL. Sorry, guys, this is post-production Eddie again. I, I couldn't help but comment on this. In my lipoprotein metabolism paper that I wrote quite a while back, basically a few months ago, I wrote all of this information down about lipoprotein metabolism, and I remember whenever I just heard Alo say about HDL being a lipoprotein that carries a lot of triglyceride content, I had to pause it during editing and say to myself, well, I wrote a table showing on average what each lipoprotein carries in terms of its total percentage content of contents and it didn't sound right to me and I just reviewed this and look at this triglycerides 90% of chylomicrons are constituted of triglycerides or composed of triglycerides that's what they carry 55% of triglycerides is what VLDL carries 30% of IDL is composed of triglycerides and then 15% of LDL and 15% of HDL on average is composed of triglycerides now if we're going to be extremely accurate here or forgiving I don't know the integrity of of these numbers because I would have to find out how they were derived. But if the difference in percentage points is this stark between, for example, chylomicrons and HDL, I find it very hard to believe that HDL, especially given what I do know already about lipoprotein metabolism from these previous six pages, that HDL carries any significant amount of triglycerides at all. So once again, Alo, you are showing your absolute destitution of f***ing knowledge in this space. As a cardiologist, you want to talk about being a lipidologist and knowing about lipids, and yet you can't even get that right. Good stuff, Alo. You end up with a slightly lower HDL count. It can affect your LDL. That's way more nuanced. Uh, triglycerides are primarily carried by VLDL, I believe. It's either that or VLDL primarily carries triglycerides, because those do not mean the same thing. So I'll be sparing here. I do know that triglycerides primarily carry, or sorry, VLDL molecules primarily carry triglycerides. Very small amount of cholesterol and other cholesterol esters and stuff. So cholesterol book for that. Now, the biggest no, problem... never, never, never refer to his cholesterol book for anything, except for a laugh, okay? For laughable content. LDL cholesterol, it went from 81 to 265 or whatever I said earlier. Okay, so is this where you're finally going? So 11 minutes into your video. So what is that? What is that? Here, here. We'll just we'll just round up. We're at 12 minutes out of 17 minutes. 12 divided by 17 times 100. So so 71% into your video, you're finally going to... 71% 70, of the video is done. And you're finally going to get into why you believe it's, 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 it's scary? Good, great. Thanks for wasting our time, Allah. That is problematic. No, that's your opinion. And it's, once again, based upon fallacious and erroneous information. And also, in many cases, disinformation when you talk about the fraud and the conflict of interest in some of these studies. We now know, based on data, and I'll put the charts in this. Oh, we know based on data. Good, good. So convicting language in order to beguile innocent and unsuspecting people and impressionable people into your ideology and your theology, your dangerous theology. Good, okay. Your anti-human ideology flies in the face of every single bit of information we have, hard scientific information about human physiology. Good, okay. So we have data that also Allo can't interpret anyway. It's up here kind of as we go along. We now know that LDL cholesterol bias. So, okay, so the Mendelian randomization studies, which, oh my God. Allo, the Mendelian randomization study, first and foremost, what they did was they took people that exhibited genes that are highly associated with an increased production of LDL molecules, and they did a prospective cohort study on these people and showed that they died earlier than other people that didn't exhibit those genes. First of all, that doesn't mean f***ing anything. But second of all, not once did they measure or calculate these people's LDL levels at all. First of all, that was the case. But second of all, even if they did, you would have to continuously measure the LDL levels because they vary month to month, Allo. And given certain circumstances, they'll change even more and in different ways because the genes responsible for encoding for the production of LDL respond to the environment in which you place them. Really? Vapid, unscientific claptrap. Has met the criteria. In research, we have a criteria for causality. 
Like, how can we say? No, Alo, that is an opinion based upon other authors that stated, oh, well, if these criteria that we made up are met, then you can establish causality. You can't establish causality with prospective cohort studies. You arrogant f Wad. Why am I calling you that? Because you are sitting here using your appeal to authority, saying that you're a cardiologist and a lipidologist, and first of all, explaining that you misunderstand lipidology and the etiology behind cardiovascular disease entirely. But not only that, Alo, even if you did know it and you were explaining your knowledge of it, you're also pretending like you understand scientific interpretation. And you don't, Alo. You absolutely do not. So now you're sitting here talking to an impressionable audience, making them think that you understand how to interpret science because you are a cardiologist. Cardiologists are not trained in the interpretation of science. And if you did your own private studying and reviewing, you're still demonstrating that it wasn't good enough. It wasn't sufficient and or responsibly done. Inappropriate, irresponsible, and you ought to be ashamed of yourself. And honestly, you should have your license revoked. That's just my opinion, though. The X causes Y. Well, LDL cholesterol has met the causality criteria for... No, it hasn't. You could say that it's met criteria that other people made up, which is true. They made it up, okay? You can't do that. Well, I think that if something meets this criterion, this criterion, this criterion, this criterion, that we can say that it's causal. Well, you can't do that, can you? You can't say that, can you? Not at all. I mean, this is amazing, Alo. And if you, and Alo, if you understood how to actually interpret science, you would understand that that's not the case. I thank you for making this video in a way because now I get to show how silly and inane you are on my channel to all of my more perspicacious and sagacious viewers and cerebral and sapient and present viewers, okay? Sorry, guys. I hope that this is the last little section that we got. By itself, without anything else, you don't need inflammation, you don't need arterial damage, you don't need diabetes, you don't need insulin resistance. LDL cholesterol by itself, if it is high, will cause atherosclerosis in false absolutely not okay so let's actually get into the mechanisms here atherosclerosis heart disease only occurs in arteries and never occurs in veins despite the fact that the blood cholesterol content and lipoprotein content in both of those blood supplies is equivalent effectively not only that even the plaque that builds up in the arteries is not formed in a blanket fashion it forms in set sites sorry about that guys change of a shirt because i just spilled my drink all over my uh my other one Good. Anyway, what was even being said here? Oh yes, basically the plaque builds up in specific sites, those sites being the sites in the vasculature that experience the most turbulence in hypertensive situations, which causes the blood flow to exert more pressure on the surrounding areas for longer periods of time, which causes plaque buildup over the course of multiple decades usually. That plaque is constituted of one plus or minus one percent of cholesterol, lipoproteins, foam cells, any of that stuff all combined. It's actually largely composed of scar tissue that can become calcified at later stages, become unstable and rupture, then get lodged and cause a blood clot, also known as thrombi. That's actually the etiology of heart disease. Dr. Allo, LDL, cholesterol, all of those different lipoproteins that you're referring to, they have no bearing in terms of their levels on heart disease risk, and they also make up almost none of the plaque. They're actually microcalluses, okay? LDL is present there in order to provide cholesterol for the repair process on the endothelial wall and for the epithelial cells. And there's more proteoglycan content in arteries as compared to veins because of the fact that, well, they're more susceptible to damage because of hypertension that occurs there. So high blood pressure, chronically high blood pressure is the cause of heart disease. Now, what causes chronic hypertension? Well, that is chronic inflammation that has not surceased due to some sort of externality or externalities. The primary most relevant one ostensibly is diet. And also it is my opinion that it absolutely is diet because most of the things that we know that cause inflammation directly stem and are derived from diet. So anyway, does that make sense, Alo? So anyway, what, everything that you just put up here makes no claims about causality in terms of the actual data concerned. The authors did. Also, since this was a prospective cohort study, how much was this adjusted for? In other words, fabricated. How much was it fabricated? Because scientists report what they observe, not what they think they would have observed if they had done the study differently in an ideal world, where they could have exerted complete control over their subjects and over populations. Okay, each time that you stack univariate regression on top of the original univariate regression you derived from your study in order to adjust for results by considering considering risk factors, which aren't risk factors anyway, we covered that, you get farther and farther from establishing an association. You inflate the power of your result, and oftentimes you just change the entire result 180 degrees backwards from what you observed, okay? How much was it fabricated? I will cause atherosclerosis in most people, and LDL cholesterol, if we dropped it down to a- It's not cholesterol, covered that. ...number that is very, very low, 
like I said, watch my LDL target. First of all, that's vague and also arguably th that's dangerous, okay? Because when you tell people to do that, what are you then going to tell them is the best way of doing such a thing? You're going to tell them to take a statin? You know, if you want more, but if your LDL cholesterol is quite low, below 55, like the Jupiter trial, for example, below 57. Yeah, the Jupiter trial. I wrote about that in my book as well. Good. Yeah. Okay. And that was actually, if I recall correctly, that was a study that was the only one out of a series of studies that had any significance to it at all that did the, the, those studies doing the same thing. Anyway. Very minimal, if any, atherosclerosis. And in most trials, like the PISA trial, people with an LDL cholesterol below 60 milligrams per deciliter no atherosclerosis. So we know somewhere around 55 well, to 60. Let's say that you're correct. Who cares? Does that necessarily mean that's a good thing? No. For example, there are people that exhibit extremely high levels of cholesterol because they have bona fide familial hypercholesterolemia, not the familial hypercholesterolemia that is deemed familial hypercholesterolemia, which is, I don't know, just exhibiting higher levels of LDL because your genetics seem to be encoded to do such a thing. That's not genuine, dangerous familial hypercholesterolemia. The one that I'm talking about is the one that involves a complete gene knockout that prevents the body from sequestering excess lipoprotein content and therefore cholesterol content from the bloodstream via the liver. That will cause these people to exhibit extremely high cholesterol levels and they will have cholesterol deposits in their eyelids. And also, yes, they will exhibit plaque that has a significant component being LDL because it has nowhere else to go. It has to enter through cytosis into the arterial walls. Yes. Those people, since their bodies don't have the genes to sequester cholesterol, die of cellular starvation because they are so bereft of it. So now you're telling people that have normal genes to drop their LDL extremely low. Well, what do you think is going to happen? Most people will not have atherosclerosis. So th no, that is an irresponsible claim. That was a causal claim, actually. You said the lower your LDL is, the lower your risk of heart disease is. That's what you just implied there. That is what was meant by what you just said. Irresponsible and honestly criminal. It really is criminal. And, and seriously, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. I hope that whenever I tag you in this video, you watch it in full and you feel the need to contact me or something. Because, I mean, seriously, this is ridiculous. You need to front up for this. And went from 80, which is just above that. You know, she's still under 100 definitely not under 70, but a little bit more modification, maybe a very low dose statin could have got her there. Not that a 20. Okay. So now you're encouraging once again, I, I did, I didn't say anything until you did. So now you're encouraging people take, you know, low dose statin criminal once again. So if nobody realized how lost you were before now, they definitely do, or at least they should absolute mitochondrial poisons. They knock out the CoQ enzyme within the electron transport chain in your mitochondria that leads to damage, which leads to inflammation. But then over time that leads to destruction and therefore cellular death, which is precisely what leads to the degeneration generation of nerves and muscle including the heart because the heart's a f***ing muscle Allo. so i mean honestly like nice going older and i'm not sure how the old this person is but not that a 20 or 30 year old needs to be on statins but if their ldl cholesterol is 265 like it is now and it's been like that for those five years that they've been carnivore then who gives a f because that's what their genes are encoded to produce, given the circumstances. Here's the thing, even if LDL were causal in heart disease, if we know the LDL production is regulated by the genes, then you should not be trying to regulate the genes externally. You should be trying to find the source that is causing elevated LDL in the first place and eliminating that. Fortunately, there's no need to do that because LDL is not causal. But this is so backwards. There's so many errors here. That's problematic. No, that's your opinion. And it's based on complete absence of scientific knowledge. So well, that's one thing that is severely abnormal. And none of these doctors that she interviewed. Well, abnormal is not indicative of distressing, counterproductive, or harmful, or deleterious. Pick your word. If anything, normal is indicative of that. <laughs> Look around you, Alo. Or... Watched a lot of their interviews are giving her good advice. One of them's a family doctor. There was another one that was a family doctor. And I just don't, they're trying their best to analyze their labs. The one family doctor is like, yeah, you know, you got the high HDL and all this. Like they don't even know what they're talking about. They're using. Oh yeah. Wow. Projection. Alo just said that people don't know what they're talking about. Good stuff. Alo. Really good stuff. Alo. This is hilarious. Very outdated data from like 30 years ago. They've not read a study probably since then. Family doctors. <laughs> well, does that really make a difference though? Because I mean, even though you read studies, you don't know how to read them. Honestly, I think it's better to not read studies than to read them improperly.
very good at managing cholesterol, you know, when it's basic and in general, but not to the level of- You're an offensive moron, Alo, and I want to just explicitly state that now. I haven't actually like really, really said it the way that I just did, and I think I, I really need to. You are an offensive, insulting moron with an ego that is going unchecked. Your hubris is, oh, I can't say unmatched. Lane Norton's ego is larger. Paul Saladino's, actually, is massive. Probably the biggest. Lane Norton and Paul are button heads with that, but yours is up there. It really is. Lipidologist or a cardiologist, so I think she's just getting bad advice from people that are trying but just don't know any better. She also is getting advice. Right, right. Oh, yeah, they're trying, but they just don't know any better. Good. You know what's funny is that even if you don't mean it in a patronizing way, when you don't know what you're talking about and then you say these things, it's like necessarily patronizing. Because I mean, if you really, really, really were humble, this is how you know it's patronizing. If he really were humble, like he's trying to come across as, he would have objectively interpreted his research. If someone doesn't do that, then they're not humble. Because that's what humility is. You have to be objective. If you are not objective, you're not humble. She also is getting advice from basically scammers some who scammers what do you mean scammers who are you talking about perhaps she has who knows she interviews a lot of people well she interviewed that call themselves doctors and i'm not going to say their names because you know i don't want oh right 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 so you won't say their names you won't say their names now there's a few reasons why he could be saying that it could be because he actually has no evidence for that or it could be actually what i think it is is that if he calls them out he's afraid of what they'll say in response okay who are you talking about is it just because you couldn't find evidence that they were a doctor by the way because you can hide that really well Wow. ...people further, but some of these people that are calling themselves doctors literally have no medical degree and are not doctors. Some of the people... Right, right. And, and then as soon as he says that, the, the editing on the screen, Dr. Muhammad Allo, cardiologist. This is the world we live in, folks. ...interviewed, have no medical license. Maybe they were a doctor at some point in their life, but their medical license was suspended or taken away. She oh, are you referring to Dr. Sean Baker? He's covered that in detail, and I'm not going to get into it. A couple of surgeons here and there, which know nothing about, you know, managing cholesterol whatsoever. Well, neither do you. And even if you did, which you probably know, yeah, you, you probably know how to manage cholesterol. That's actually pretty easy. The hell? What you really mean to say, though, is artificially tamper with the level. And so even if you do know everything about that, well, no one should be listening to you then because no one should be trying to tamper with their cholesterol. Okay, you offensive ass. Really problematic. She's getting advice from basically idiots. Um, right, right. So he won't name names, but he'll then say, well, well, basically idiots. Uh, basically idiots. Good. Alo, hey, so if you have the courage of your own convictions, please email me and we can have a conversation one-on-one. -on -one. It doesn't have to be live. It could be pre-recorded. I will do all of that. I've never done a live, so I kind of don't even want to touch that. I've never done a live anything. We can just have a discussion. It could be pre-recorded and you face me and we can have a conversation about what you had to say today in this video. Because frankly, frankly, Alo, this is ridiculous. And I think that you owe, first of all, Bella an apology, but also your audience an apology. You also should take down your channel and your podcast and anything else that has, you know, this type of rhetoric on it that you're using a public platform to promulgate with. Okay. That's just my personal advice. And it's not humble at all. Okay. I'm not being humble with you whatsoever. No, that's what you need to do. I have no idea what they're talking about. And I don't like to denigrate people or bullshit yes you do you don't want to do it publicly because you don't want people to chastise you in return and retaliate you absolutely do you've done it before when professor bart k called you out on your bullshit at one point you had a response video and you decided to not only denigrate him but lie about him <laughs> and then what happened anyway you weren't invited to the conference which is what that was all about so you know anyway names but when you are purporting yourself to be a cholesterol expert and you're actually not that projection very problematic. You are miss. Uh, it is problematic. I think. I think it is really problematic, Allo. I think you're really problematic. I think you're really problematic. Therefore, in the public and causing more harm than good. Mm, yeah. Okay. So we actually need to be very careful when we talk about information promulgation here. Okay. The promulgation of false information is not dangerous. It only becomes dangerous when you suppress the promulgation of proper information. Okay. The rhetoric that states that misinformation is inherently dangerous is actually in and of itself dangerous because that implies that it should be curtailed with force. First rule in medicine was first do no harm. It's a Hippocratic. Yeah, it's the Hippocratic Oath, Alo. I actually mentioned that just now. Funny that you mentioned it. Once again, I have not watched this video. I watched the first two and a half minutes before this cut was a thing. Anyway, Alo, what's your point? The first do no harm. You are doing a lot of harm by telling... No, you are not doing a lot of harm by telling people that their cholesterol levels have no bearing on their risk of cardiovascular disease.
this young lady that her LDL cholesterol of 265 is okay. The other thing that- It is okay, actually, Alo. There's no evidence to suggest that it's not. And there's actually evidence to suggest that artificially tampering with that is harmful because of the methods by which one employs to do such a thing. Notice is that on carnivore, her re C-reactive protein went up. It was previously zero or undetectable. Now it's 0.3. Uh, Maybe you're right. But what I saw was that it wasn't measured. That's what that told me. Yup. Alo back at it again. Not available. Above one is generally problematic and above two is quite inflammatory. She didn't list the milligrams or however it's being measured. But okay, so even then, let's say that you're right, which by the way are arbitrary cutoffs, 0 0.3. Who the f*** cares then, Alo? What does the CRP even measure? If I cared enough, I'd look it up, by the way. Notice how I'm not looking it up though, because I don't give a f*** Alo. Generally speaking, that's problematic. We know that saturated fat Let's see what he says about this. And red meat is one of the most pro-inflammatory substances you can- There it is. Alo, I covered that earlier in the video. Rewind my video and watch what I said carefully. Grab your pen and paper and take notes, okay? Zoom, the other one is salt. Salt is- <gasps> Salt causes inflammation, guys. Wow, this is really bad. This is really, really bad. Really bad. Is that what he said? One of the most pro-inflammatory substances you can consume. The other one is salt. Salt causes inflammation. What the f*** is wrong with you, Alo? Email me, edgoki14 at gmail.com. We will have a conversation. You make a fool of yourself online in front of me. I want you to do that. Or what you can do is you can cower away and make a response video, and I'll tear that down next time too, okay? Does that sound good? Salt doesn't cause inflammation. Let alone, is it the second most inflammatory thing you can consume? What the hell are you talking about? Salt is very pro-inflammatory, saturated fat and red meat is very pro-inflammatory. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good job. Wow. Oh, man. This is one of the worst videos I've ever seen in a long time. I've seen in a long time. This is really bad. If you're eating processed red meat, like sausage, bologna, hot dogs, things like- Ground beef is processed, Alo. All meat is processed, okay? You are getting salt plus a lot of saturated fat, plus red meat in an So, by the way, Alo, the primary form of fat found within animal products, especially ruminant animal products, which is what you're mentioning with red meat, is monounsaturated. You know, the fats that are actually touted to be healthy, which there's no evidence to support that claim either, because that's a cause and effect statement. <laughs> salt, salt is inflammatory. What the f***? What is happening? I can't get over that. Salt is inflammatory. What is the mechanism behind that? Sodium chloride. Sodium chloride. You know, but there's no, there's nothing inflammatory in plants, though. Nope. Plus red meat in and of itself. So those are all... What is the mechanism behind red meat being inflammatory, Alo? Do you know the constituents of red meat? Fatty acids in the form of monounsaturated, saturated, and very little polyunsaturated. Okay, so fat, cholesterol, and cholesterol esters. But cholesterol esters are cholesterol molecules with ester bonds formed to fat, so still fat. Cholesterol, we already covered cholesterol. Amino acids, sulfur-containing amino acids. Okay, great. And water until you cook it and then there's very little water. Actually, in fact, water is the primary constituent of pre-cooked meat, if you didn't know that. <laughs> and then when you cook it, it's protein. So un unless you're saying animal protein itself, the amino acids, sulfur containing amino acids are inflammatory or something because of like the mechanisms behind mTOR and all that stuff, which is just more claptrap from vegans. I've covered that before. Patreon exclusive that I'm thinking of right now. Give me a break, Alo. Seriously. Uh, inherently problematic as well. So No, you're inherently problematic, Alo. This whole video and this ent entire account is problematic on many accounts and in many different ways. Wow, I mean, the projection is just unreal with this one. The hypocrisy. I don't recommend that anybody follow this kind of diet. This isn't a, a no. Well, that's your opinion. And once again, it's predicated upon erroneous information and theology. I wouldn't even call it information. It's just theology. It's fallacious, Alo. One of these diets, it's in a long line of crazy diets that hopefully will well, that's an ad hom term, and it's your opinion once again, and once again, it's based upon erroneousness. I will repeat myself till you stop talking and stop saying these words, which mean nothing. They are weightless, given your very demonstrable lack of understanding of human physiology. Diets that hopefully will die at some point and nobody will follow it. I yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So the diet that we were consuming for four and a half years as a species, if you include proto-humans that preceded our current speciation, that being Homo sapiens sapiens, that diet just hopefully will die off, huh? And should, yeah, yeah, okay.
not control people if you want advice from an actual cardiologist someone well an actual cardiologist here's here's the thing alo there are many other cardiologists actually that say the exact opposite of you so are you going to say that those people aren't actual cardiologists you are just spouting your stupid opinion okay so don't say that you're an actual cardiologist because the implications there are that actual cardiologists irrespective of if someone else is considered a cardiologist and had that credence conferred upon them by an institution must agree with you they have to agree with you or else they're not a cardiologist it's just stupid Okay, just like this nonsense you're espousing here on this sh on this video today that we've eviscerated thoroughly understands lipids and isn't trying to sell you a fake false dream or trying to clog up your arteries for personal gain or to try really okay now that now you're just desperate they're trying to clog up your arteries for personal gain good wow great framing there what a d and also like, like you're just wrong Alo. and we explained why you're wrong so let's let you finish fool you in any way i highly recommend you follow someone like myself or Dr. yeah of course you'd recommend people do that i would recommend that people not only not follow you but actually try and get your license revoked it's day spring um, he's the lipid editor of my book the co-editor or lip well if he's an editor and he approves your book then i would recommend that no one listen to him ever upon anything related to this topic at all as well i've heard his name referenced before never seen him before though not familiar with him of the li lipoprotein and lipid sections of my book and those are people that actually know what they are talking about I'll no they're not they're people that want to believe that they know what they're talking about and have severe dunning-kruger syndrome and have a superiority complex over the people they talk to first of all but also the people that actually do know what they're talking about and understand absolute hard sciences you need to exhibit some humility sunshine and you need to front up to your claims as well here email me at edgoki14 at gmail.com i will reach out with a tag in my title my video that's me reaching out okay because i effectively have sent you it and then you watch it then you make your response video or email me and we'll have a discussion face to face okay we'll obviously of course have to discuss what the discussion will be about but that'll be easy okay we're done alo up here if you search his name he comes up on a lot of podcasts and a lot of videos highly recommend that you follow people that know what they're talking about and yeah i highly recommend that you do that too so please go ahead and subscribe to this channel and like the video and try and get alo's license revoked actually for being irresponsible in his rhetoric and then that's not an attack on like freedom of speech or expression that's not tyrannical if you're being irresponsible with your rhetoric and saying things that are absolutely not underpinned by science and saying this causes this and this causes that and going out of your lane and trying to say that you basically know how to interpret science despite you being a cardiologist and therefore not having had any training in in doing such a thing then you deserve Deserve to have penalty or to be penalized for that. I don't know the rules, but go look into it. Just follow, like, and share this for people who want to learn more. No, 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 no. Follow and subscribe to me. Share this video with all your friends and family so that they can learn more. My video, my reaction to this hot, look at, look at his face right now. Look at that smile, the complacent smile. Like, yeah, yeah, I really, I really showed them. I really know what I'm talking about. I mean, for example, did he really give any evidence that these, these results are scary? Did he show anything at all? He showed one graph of the Mendelian randomization study. The most, like the amount of banality that is contained within that study is exactly exorbitant. It's ridiculous. I already covered that one. A prospective cohort study is epidemiology, and epidemiology doesn't show us f***ing anything, Alo. There's so many flaws with it. It does not establish causality, okay? Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, please subscribe to the channel, please leave your thoughts in the comment section below, and also, once again, subscribe to the Patreon if you haven't already, and buy my book Contraindicated if you haven't already, and most importantly, the link on the bottom of the screen. What is that link? I referenced it earlier. That is a link that will bring you to an amazing site with amazing products from an amazing brand known as Cerule. If you purchase product through that link, you will get a permanent 10% discount and permanent free shipping discount when signing up for monthly deliveries. And also, if you email me at edgoki14 at gmail.com behind the scenes, I can tell you how to earn those products for free because who in their right mind would not want that? Now, of course, like I said earlier, don't just buy these products without looking into what they are. I would, of course, refer to, once again, the description below to find the two videos I was referencing earlier, one of them being a complete explanation and elucidation video as to what those products products are, who should take them, why you should take them, when to take them, etc, etc, as well as the other one being an interview between myself and Professor Bart K about those products in far further detail, as well as the company of Cerule itself, which I think is extremely important. If you are someone that would not like to have a recurring payment to either Patreon or Cerule, for example, and you've already bought my book and you still want to support me in some way, I do have a GoFundMe link in the description below for one-time donations if you have the money available, as per the request of certain individuals, and also I think it's probably for the best. And also finally, once again, email me at edgo. 14 at gmail.com if you have any other questions whatsoever. And with that being said, join me next time when someone else exemplifies their complete
complete incompetence with respect to lipidology and cardiology, and actually, in reality, the etiology behind heart disease in general. Cardiovascular disease and all of its manifestations. It's very simple, actually, in reality, but Alo doesn't quite get it, and it's quite unfortunate. So, till then.